Thank you. Um, so let's take a survey. I'm going to give you three options. But the question is, what will the grid's need for fossil fuels be in 2050? OK, what will the grid's need for fossil fuels be in 2050? And I'll give you three options. One is, it won't need them at all. Two is, it'll barely need them. And three is, they'll be essential. So just raise your hand whichever one you agree with. And this is a safe space. You can say whatever you want. Uh, OK, so one, they won't be needed at all. OK, I don't see any hands. Uh, two, they'll barely be needed. Does anyone have? I can't see anyone's hands. Um, and three, they'll be essential. OK, so that's basically all the hands. All right, so that's the first question. So everyone here agrees that fossil fuels will be essential by 2050. As you might imagine, I have a book called Fossil Future. I agree with that. Um, now here's question two. What's the most popular political idea in the world today? You can shout out. Louder. Carbon free, yeah, exactly. So basically, in one form or another, we should rapidly eliminate the use of fossil fuels by 2050. So it sometimes goes by net zero by 2050. It sometimes goes by uh, carbon free, carbon neutral. Uh, but the basic idea is we should be using little or no fossil fuel by 2050. Now, one thing we can talk about in the Q&A, and we have some, a lot of time, so we ask in the Q&A. Um, some people might argue, oh, we can use fossil fuels. We can use just as much fossil fuel or more, and we'll just capture all the carbon. Uh, I don't think that's remotely likely to be the case, but feel free to raise that. But I think most people, and certainly most opponents of fossil fuels, don't think that we're going to achieve carbon neutrality by using a lot of fossil fuels. They think we're going to achieve it by getting rid of fossil fuels. So let's just think about this. We have you guys who are experts in electricity saying that the grid absolutely needs fossil fuels through 2050. And literally the most, and I, you're right, literally the most popular political idea in the world today. So this is an idea that's agreed to by large corporations, by financial institutions, and virtually every government in the world has committed in one way or another to the elimination of fossil fuels by 2050. So we have, this is essential to life. So we, essential to the grid, which means it's essential literally to life. We cannot survive without the grid for even a week. And yet the most popular idea is to eliminate this thing that is essential to the grid. So I, I view this as an existential problem. I think it's an existential problem in general um, in terms of the, you know, the world needs fossil fuels. But I, the, the, the grid is, I'm particularly glad to be speaking today because for me the grid is particularly urgent. I just think it's one of these situations where there's an obvious train wreck happening, where you have on the one hand, the government is artificially increasing demand for electricity, and then you also have organic demand for electricity, and then the government is artificially restricting the supply of electricity, and it's already a disaster, and they want to do far, far more. So, you know, in North Dakota, so some people are fighting back against this. I was, I was talking to the governor uh, last night. We couldn't meet in person because I, I got delayed, and actually he got delayed. But he said, you know, tell them I say hi and that we're fighting back against all these things like regional haze and the EPA power plant rules. And it's great. I mean, Governor Burgum's doing a great job fighting back. Many people are doing a great job fighting back. But there needs to be a lot more fighting. And I believe the electricity industry has a particular role to play. I think the electricity industry needs, has generally been silent for, for various reasons. And the world needs to hear from you guys most of all that we are destroying our grid with these policies and certainly with the ambitions. And so what I want to do today is share with you what I think uh, are the best ways to fight back. And, and so the, the bad news is the most popular idea in the world today would destroy our grid and destroy the world. That's a bad thing. That's a really bad state of affairs. I think the good news is uh, there's more opportunity than ever to fight back. And there are basically two reasons why I think it's, it's a unique moment right now. The first one is 
that the promises of net zero or rapidly eliminating fossil fuels have dramatically failed to come true. So if you, you, you go back, even back as recently as 2020, but certainly before 2020, the net zero movement was saying, hey, look, you can, we'll get rid of fossil fuels and you're gonna be rich, right? You're gonna have this fantastic green economy, you're gonna have more electricity than ever, you're gonna have more abundance than ever, it's, it's just gonna be amazing. And then what started to happen was we started even pretty slowly, relatively, relatively to what they wanted, shutting down fossil fuel power plants. And then suddenly people started seeing, wait, we're starting to have more problems with reliability than we used to. to. And I know this firsthand as a Californian for basically my whole adult life. You know, we had in 2020 statewide blackouts. And then shortly thereafter, our governor announces, hey, no more internal combustion engines by 2035. You need to use all EVs. And then literally six days later, six days later, his government said, don't charge your EVs, we don't have enough electricity. So, and people are saying, wait, maybe this has to do with shutting down these power plants. And then, of course, we see the situation in Texas, which I think they tried to paper over, but basically, they didn't invest a lot in natural gas and certainly not in resilience of their natural gas and coal fleet. They spent tens and tens of billions of dollars on solar and wind. When solar and wind were needed the most, they were totally out to lunch. I'm not inherently against solar and wind, but this is the fact of the situation. They provided essentially zero reliable capacity during that winter storm. Um, and Texans start to wake up. So the, the world is starting to wake up. You're also starting to see, people are starting to see, wait a second, when we restrict oil, that seems to lead to higher gasoline prices and more vulnerability to places like Russia and Iran and Venezuela. And then this isn't as, as reported, but it's really, really important. People are starting to see in the poorest parts of the world, hey, wait a second, when we suppress coal production, natural gas production, that makes it, we create shortages, and that makes it hardest for the poorest places in the world to afford electricity. So Bangladesh has electricity shortages when Europe is buying up all the natural gas after they banned fracking, but then realized that they needed natural gas. So it's a really, uh, I've been studying this issue for 17 years. There's never been a moment, I think, where people are more open to the idea that there's something wrong with this net zero movement. They, they can't quite put their finger on what's wrong, except that the consequences are not what was promised. So I'll talk about what's actually wrong, but, but there's an openness to it. And I think that's really good news. And then the second thing, which is what I want to focus today, is compared to when I started uh, in 2007, there have been dramatic improvements in how to think about and message this issue. And this has, in fact, been a focus of my career, is to help with both of these things. How do we think about and message this issue uh, better. And I'll play a video in a second, but for me, the key is actually uh, something you might not expect. So I'll play a clip, and this is of me talking to my senator, Barbara Boxer, when I was testifying in front of the Senate. And she said, we don't have any need for somebody like you, and then I tried to explain why she did. So let's play the clip. Neither of us were mute. Let's see if we can do it again. Committee. I think it's interesting we have a philosopher here talking about an issue. It's to teach you how to think more clearly. So I don't know if you called the whole thing, but she basically said, it's interesting we have a philosopher here, like we shouldn't have a philosopher here, and I said, it's to teach you how to think more clearly. And then her staff laughed at her, which is a highlight of my, my day. So philosophy is thought of as this useless subject that doesn't help really with anything. And I actually used to be in computer science and software engineering, and I chose to go into philosophy because I think it's the most practical subject. Oh. And what philosophy does is it helps you think about the basic ideas that guide your thinking and actions, including things like your thinking methods and your assumptions about the world and your values. And what I'm gonna argue is 
the way people think about this issue of fossil fuels makes no sense, and the values they're applying don't make much sense. And the good news is you can explain this to people. So most people are thinking about this issue in a way that they wouldn't actually endorse if they knew what it was, and they're applying values that they wouldn't endorse if they knew what they were. And so really a lot of the key to what I've been able to do is help people identify, hey, how should we think about this issue? What do we really value? And if you can help, I call this, you know, reframing. If you can help people reframe their thinking, they actually pretty easily come to the position that the world needs a lot of fossil fuels and actually I'd argue more fossil fuels uh, going forward. So there are two basic ideas that I want to talk about. So one is being even-handed and the other is being human-centered. So even, I'll, I'll, and I'll elaborate on both of these. Uh, but what these two things are going to enable you to do is you can be anti-net zero and pro-fossil fuels without one being a, quote, climate change denier, that's not a good term, but without saying, hey, we have no impact on climate, I definitely believe we do have an impact on climate, so it's not, not about saying there's no impact on climate, there's no, quote, climate change, it's not about that. You can still recognize that insofar as you believe in it, which I do to some extent, um, but you also don't concede net zero. And I think th uh, this is unfortunately rare. Usually what happens is people will either say like, hey, yeah, we need more fossil fuels, climate change is a hoax, that's kind of one end of it. Or the other end is, yeah, climate change is real, so yeah, we need to get off fossil fuels. And I think that's a totally false alternative once you're able to think about it in an even-handed and human-centered way. So what do I mean by even-handed? So the idea of even-handed, or you could call it balanced, is a very simple idea. And what's fascinating about this idea is nobody has ever disputed this idea when, I've, when I raise it, and yet almost nobody follows it. And so it's a very simple idea. So just I'll give you the analogy of thinking about taking an antibiotic. When you think about taking an antibiotic, you go to the doctor, and they tell you what? They say, here are the benefits, and here are the side effects and here's how they compare to the alternatives, right? So when we're making decisions about technologies or medicine or products, we carefully weigh the benefits and side effects of our alternatives. Everyone agree with this? Yeah, it's, it seems pretty straightforward. And nobody disputes this, uh, but actually almost nobody follows it. So when it comes to fossil fuels, it is incredibly common for people only to look at negative side effects and not look at benefits. And, and one of the examples that first struck me in this regard as really important is I started learning about the role of fossil fuels in food production. So fossil fuels have two really crucial roles in food production, I mean more than two, but two that stand out above all. Uh, anyone want to take a stab at what they are? What's that, packaging? Well, that's actually number three. That's a great one, too. So packaging, yeah, we have, you know, they, they, uh, hydrocarbons are used to make the materials that allow us to keep food uh, sanitary and safe for a long time. But there are two others that are arguably even bigger than that. Transport. transport. Okay, that's another one. That's actually still not one of the, the biggest two. But yeah, you need to transport food. Fertilizer, yeah, that's one of them. So natural gas derived fertilizer arguably makes it possible for 4 billion people to live who otherwise wouldn't live. And the other one, it's related to transportation, but is mechanized agriculture. So the ability to use machines to do agricultural work in the place of manual labor, something like a combine harvester that multiplies the uh, productive ability of a worker by a thousandfold. Right, so a person can reap a thousand times as much and thresh a thousand times as much wheat as they otherwise could. So, Mechanized agriculture through diesel, primarily, and then fertilizer through natural gas, this makes it possible for us to eat. And what I started learning, because I, I didn't grow up in a pro-fossil fuel environment or anything like that, I, I realized, wait a second, fossil fuels are crucial to food, but all the experts only talk about how fossil fuels are negative to food. So they talk about, for example, hey, if it gets warmer, it might har be harder to grow crops in one place. And okay, we should study that, but shouldn't we also study the benefits? And what I realized is at the highest level, so-called experts don't look at the benefits of fossil fuels. And in chapter one of my book, Fossil Future, I make the point that uh, one of the leading experts on energy and climate in the world, a guy named Michael Mann, who's quoted all the time, he has a whole book on fossil fuels and climate. He doesn't once mention diesel agriculture or natural gas fertilizer, but he only talks about negatives. And so if we only talk about the negatives of fossil fuels or anything, we're not going to come up with any kind of good thinking. Now, the good news here is 
although most people are taught to think about only the negatives of fossil fuels, everyone, almost everyone is open to thinking about the positives. And so what you need to do when you're talking to people, and, and more and more people are adopting this, and it's been working really well, and particularly heartened to see when congressmen start to use this, they'll basically say, hey, look, don't you agree that when we're talking about fossil fuels, we need to look at both positives and negatives? Like, it's that simple. And what do you think people say? Yeah, they usually say yes. Nobody can really disagree with that. And you say, look, you have to carefully weigh positives and negatives, benefits and side effects. And what happens is when people do that, then they're open to thinking about the truth in an even-handed or balanced way. But if you, don't, if you don't frame it that way, then they won't do it. So the way to think of it is people are programmed to be very biased, but it's pretty quick to unprogram them. You just have to say, you don't say, hey, you're being biased. Just say, hey, do you agree we should look at both the pros and the cons? And they'll say yes, and then they'll be open to the facts. So this has been one really important thing in how to talk about it. Don't just jump into the facts and making factual claims, because they're going to process it through a biased filter. But if you can get them to think about it in a balanced or even-handed way, if you get them to agree to do that, or at least say yourself, hey, here's how I think about it, then they'll actually start to process the facts. So that's one, this idea of being even-handed, carefully weighing benefits and side effects. And then the second idea, and this is a little bit more subtle, but it's important, is being human-centered. So one of the things philosophy studies is values. What values are we applying? And I actually think when we're thinking about fossil fuels, we've been taught not to really value human life. Now, why do I say this? Well, what is the number one, remember what I said, what's the number one political goal in the world today? It's net zero, which, what does net zero mean? It means to eliminate our impact on climate. Now think about this. Why is our number one goal to eliminate our impact on climate? Where did that come from? Why would that be your goal? Notice that all the corporations in the world don't agree that we should have universal access to energy by 2050. That seems like a better goal. They don't agree that we should have universal human prosperity by 2050. They can't agree on that. They agree on no climate impact by 2050. Where is this idea coming from? This idea actually comes from a strain of the environmental movement, which I would call the anti-human environmental movement, that believes that it's evil for humans to impact nature. And this idea has unfortunately spread in lots of ways. But we have this idea, it's wrong for us to impact nature, and our number one goal should be to absolve ourselves of our sins by not impacting nature. And they've just applied it to climate. They've said, our number one goal should be, let's not impact climate. But why is that a goal? How does that make any sense at all? First of all, why was it your number one goal, even if it's a goal at all, why is it your number one goal to prioritize not impacting climate over everything else? That doesn't make any sense. And then two, why is it even your goal not to impact climate? Like, if we could neutralize a hurricane, shouldn't we do that? And don't we impact climate indirectly all the time through our infrastructure? Like, we change the climate that we experience all the time. I call this climate mastery. That's a good thing. I mean, certainly North Dakota, you need it more than anyone, right, to change your actual climate that you experience. It's, it's important that we, what's happened is industry, I, like, I love industry and I love, I mean, I really love and admire industry, but one mistake industry makes, and, and please don't take this too negatively, but they're often passive with regard to ideas. Passive with regard to ideas. So the, uh, your opponents say, hey, let's do ESG, let's do sustainability, and the business world's like, yes, ESG, sustainability, we love it. You don't even think about what do these terms mean. Like the term sustainability, that came from Marx. That's the idea that capitalism is unsustainable and you can't leave people free, otherwise they'll destroy themselves. And it's also the idea that industry is unsustainable, you can't leave industry free. So, what happens is businesses passively accept ideas, and what's happened with this net zero idea is everyone has just agreed our number one goal should be to eliminate our impact on climate by 2050. But it doesn't make any sense. It's not actually a pro-human goal. It's based on this idea, actually an anti-human idea, that human impact is evil. And so the good news is you don't need to accept this goal, and most people won't accept this goal even if they know it. So you should make your goal positive. Don't focus on let's eliminate our impact on climate, let's focus on let's make the world a better place for people to live. And whatever is the climate policy for that, that's fine. So I would put it as our goal is not to eliminate our impact on Earth, it's to advance human flourishing 
on earth. And so both of these things make a huge difference. Thinking about the positives and negatives and thinking of it from a human perspective. Uh, and by the way, I'm seeing some people take the pictures of the slides, which is great, and I find it very flattering. But it's a good reminder, just please scan the QR code there. You'll get all the slides and a ton of other free information to share with others. So, and please take an I Love Fossil Fuels pen. But yeah, please share the QR code, because all of this information that I'm sharing here uh, is totally free and available, and you can share it with other people. So my, my basic contention is that so much of how to think about and talk about this issue is just framing it, getting people to think about it in a way where we're looking at positives and negatives in a careful way, and where our ultimate goal is to make life on Earth better for humans. And both of those are pretty common sense ideas, but they're not common practice. But my idea is when, once you frame it that way, the facts are pretty obvious that we need more fossil fuels and that net zero is literally the most destructive idea that anyone has ever come up with. Net zero by 2050, anyway. So my, my view is it's mostly about philosophy. The facts are pretty straightforward. And so I'm gonna share with you a whole bunch of facts, but these are not political facts. They're not partisan facts. I don't even have any party affiliation or anything like that. I don't support particular parties or candidates. These are just pure facts, but view, but viewed from a pro-human and even-handed perspective. And there are gonna be five big truths that I want you to remember, and then a bunch of facts underlying those, and feel free to ask about the framing of it or the facts uh, at the end. But these are, these are the things I've found most crucial to my thinking and to, uh, and to helping other people think about this issue. So truth number one is fossil fuels are uniquely cost-effective and scalable source of energy. Cost-effective and scalable. So what do I mean by, what do I mean by cost-effective? Three things. One is affordable. So something's not valuable, it's not effective, unless people can afford to use a lot of it. So there's affordability. Number two is reliability. So the ability to have it when needed, in the quantity needed, those of you in electricity obviously know a lot about this, so it's very important. You need it when you need it and in the exact quantity you need it. And then third is versatility, so the ability to provide every form of energy. I know this is an electricity group, but it's important that electricity is only about a fifth of the world's energy, about two-fifths of America's energy. It's obviously totally crucial, but there are other forms of energy uh, as well. So fossil, what I'm saying is fossil fuels, no, nothing can... Nothing is close to fossil fuels in terms of combining affordability, reliability, versatility, and then the, the fourth thing is scalability, so the availability to billions of people in thousands of places. So this is my contention, so that for the foreseeable future, let's just say the next three decades, fossil fuels are uniquely cost-effective and scalable sorts of energy. There are a bunch of counterclaims that you'll hear to this, and uh, again, please scan your QR code so you can get all of this information, and we have a lot more of it on our resources that I'll send out to you. But I want to address some of the myths that get in the way of people recognizing that fossil fuels are uniquely cost-effective and scalable. And I'm going to focus a lot here just because I know you hear a lot of these arguments, so I'm going to get in some detail. But we'll start with the simplest ones. Fossil fuels are being replaced in an energy transition to solar and wind. And the industry is always using the term energy transition and yet, in reality, there has been no energy transition. There's been an energy addition, mostly an unreliable energy addition. So fossil fuels are 80% of the world's energy. They're still growing, despite 100 plus years of competition and despite 20 plus years of political hostility. And despite huge favoritism for solar and wind. So it's not true that they're being rapidly replaced in energy transition, despite many obstacles against them. Now, the next thing you'll hear is, well, fossil fuels, the, the use is going to rapidly decline because countries know that green energy will be cheaper. And I would say to that, well, okay, what country in the world, let's, I'm curious what you guys think, what country in the world cares most about cheap energy? I would say China. Yeah, those of you who said China, I would agree, China. So what is China doing? Are they getting rid of fossil fuels? No, they have 300 plus planned coal pl plants in the pipeline. That's more capacity, new capacity added than all of US's coal fleet combined. And all of these are designed to last 40 or more years. So whatever they say about net zero by 2050, that's definitely not what they're planning. 
So then the next thing you'll hear is, okay, but solar and wind, even though fossil fuel use is growing, solar and wind are growing fast by outcompeting fossil fuels with superior economics. So it's just like the car replacing you know, the horse and buggy. Uh, maybe it takes a while to happen, but it's happening rapidly because solar and wind are growing fast. In a certain sense, they are growing fast. Year over year, they're growing at a higher rate, certainly, than fossil fuels. But they're growing fast only when given massive government preferences. And there are three big forms of this. So one is mandates, so places where we're forced to use certain amounts of solar and wind, like in California. Second is subsidies, so the government forcing us to pay huge amounts of money to you know, pay wind developers extra, which I'm sure all of you know how this distorts electricity markets. And then the third thing, which isn't discussed nearly as much, is no penalty for unreliability. So, uh, you know, in normal industry, what happens is, like if, if I go to a rental car place, they don't charge me the same for a car that works all the time and a car that works a third of the time and you don't know when. But on electricity markets, that's often what happens. And even on what's called capacity markets, they're supposed to value reliability. They give crazy high reliability ratings to solar and wind, even though solar and wind basically have no reliable capacity, unless you have huge amounts of storage, which basically nobody has. Like, you can't actually depend on them. Uh, but yet, you know, in the EPA power plant rules in some regions, they say, oh, no, solar at, uh, at peak demand, you can count on solar for 80% of nameplate capacity. I mean, it's just a total lie. Uh, but this is what's happening. So you have this huge favoritism for solar and wind, and then huge punishments for fossil fuels. So this is what's happening. This is not a natural, organic thing. Insofar as it was natural and organic, I would love it. Like, who doesn't want cheaper energy? Who doesn't want more reliable energy? And I'm all in favor of solar and wind being able to compete, but I think, we could talk about this in the q and I think they should ultimately have to compete to provide reliable electricity. So, just so you know, my basic thing is I think the grid, if you have these markets, everyone should have to provide dispatchable electricity. And then if you can do it with solar and wind and batteries, you do it on your own. But right now, you just sell unreliable electricity on the grid, and then people, everyone else has to deal with it, which I think is a, a big problem. So, the next thing you'll hear is, oh no, solar and wind are now actually cheaper than fossil fuels. You hear this all the time. And so this is a fallacy in two basic ways. One is solar and wind, they're just providing electricity. And so that's not a lot of energy. So you can't say even if they were cheaper for electricity, that doesn't mean they're cheaper for all forms of energy. Certainly they couldn't have gotten me on the plane uh, here yesterday. But the other thing is for electricity, even for electricity use, and this goes to the next point, you'll hear, well, it's getting so cheap for electricity that we'll electrify the whole world. They're just so cheap. But that is just based on what I call partial cost accounting. So you don't look at the full cost of using solar and wind to provide, un to provide reliable electricity. You just look at part of the cost. So yeah, if you just take the cost of the solar panels and the wind turbines, which is basically what LCOE, Levelized Cost of Energy, by Lazard, what those guys do, which is a total fraud, and they say explicitly, our Levelized Cost of Energy excludes reliability-related considerations. But no customer wants unreliable electricity, so it's a total fraud to, to compare the cost of unreliable solar and wind to the cost of reliable slash dispatchable coal or natural gas. So there's all these myths, but the truth is that fossil fuels are uniquely cost-effective and scalable source of energy. And there's so many more uh, of these that we can cover. I'll just go th through them quickly. Okay, well, solar and wind and batteries will be super cheap because all these performance efficiencies will improve performance and it'll just be like microchips and stuff. And like, the, the costs are so large today, people have no idea. Like on the if you're talking about Tesla mega packs, because Elon, he did this with Trump the other day, it's like, oh, we can just power the world with solar and, my, and, and batteries, usually his batteries. If you look at his prices, you're talking about 100 to $200 trillion a day worth of global storage. So this is just, that's, that's you know, global GDP is about $100 trillion. So this is just a total farce that this is actually a real thing. And also, these things don't just go down like microprocessors because they have an enormous, enormous mining component to them. So you can just, what's happening is, and, and I can go through more of these myths, but my, my basic view of this is that the anti-fossil fuel movement, all these claims that fossil fuels are easy to replace, these are not made by people who actually care about energy. 
these are made by people who care about fossil fuels climate impacts and want to get rid of fossil fuels and they just want to reassure us we can get rid of fossil fuels and it'll be fine. Because if they really thought they just had a better idea, they would just offer their stuff on a free market and not force anyone to use it. The fact that they're forcing it on us, they're basically forcing it on us and then telling you, oh, it's for your own good, you're going to be so rich. We're already seeing that's not happening. And keep this in mind, with the net zero agenda, their goal is to eliminate the use of fossil fuels. They haven't even reduced the use of fossil fuels yet globally, and they've caused an energy crisis. They've just slowed the growth and caused an energy crisis. So imagine what happens if they rapidly uh, reduce it. So there's all these different things about, um, you know, oh, it's going to get cheap and stuff like this. And you just look at the reality. And what's happening is so many of these components of solar and wind are going up in price, even with relatively modest adoption, let alone what they want. So. Um, okay, just one final one. Oh, it's going to make us energy secure to get rid of fossil fuels. I mean, come on. The, first of all, you can't be energy secure if you have no energy. That's the main point. Like, you're not going to have much energy if you don't use fossil fuels. But the other thing is we're far more dependent on China for key elements of solar and wind and batteries than we are on Russia or the Middle East for, for oil. So it's really important to recognize there's just nothing close to fossil fuels in terms of cost effectiveness and scalability. So um, you can look at in the slide deck, there are more of these, but um, I'll just cover one more, which is um, the most plausible, which is, wait, what about the reliable alternatives like nuclear and geothermal? And for me, these are more exciting, particularly nuclear, but it's very important that these are just generations away from making any kind of meaningful contribution to increasing. Nuclear is my favorite energy technology from a technical standpoint, but it's been stagnating or declining in the last several years because of the anti-nuclear movement, which is actually very closely related to the anti-fossil fuel movement. So we need radical policy reform to nuclear, but we're just nowhere near even a modestly growing nuclear industry for electricity, let alone it rapidly replacing fossil fuels. And then geothermal is much more experimental, although I think there, although I think there is some promise. So this is real, that's, that's, I wanted to get that point because it's really important that there's nothing close to fossil fuels for the foreseeable future. And as experts in electricity, I think it's important for you guys not just to know this, but to tell this to the world. The energy industry has not done a good job of telling this to the world, including not just electricity, but oil and gas. In fact, they often portray that solar and wind are just uh, as good and they can rapidly replace them. And if you, if you concede that, then that gives fuel to the anti-fossil fuel movement and it, it leads to incredibly irresponsible policies. Okay, so that was truth one. That's the one I'm going to go into the most technical detail in. So truth two then, so we have fossil fuels are uniquely cost-effective and scalable form of energy, and then the next point is cost-effective and scalable energy is essential for humans to flourish on this often unfriendly planet. So sometimes people will say, oh, you know, energy doesn't matter that much, or they, they don't think that it matters that much. And I think nothing matters more to energy, including actually for climate. We'll talk about that soon. But no, for any aspect of life, really nothing matters more than energy. You can see this chart. This is no coincidence. It's not just a random correlation. You can see as energy use goes up in, say, China and India, life expectancy goes up, and income goes up, and population goes up. So what you often hear, though, or you'll, often hear, you'll sometimes hear this, and sometimes it'll be implicit, is hey, having cost-effective energy, that's not nearly as important as CO2 reduction. Like, what really matters for a livable world is we just got to get rid of those, that evil CO2. Like, as long as we do that, we'll be fine. This is from AOC, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. She said, the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change, and your biggest issue is how are we going to pay for it? So what she's basically saying is, who cares about cost-effective energy? Why would you care about the cost of energy when the planet is at stake, right? The livability of the planet is at stake. And the truth is, she's exactly wrong. Because it's actually, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere we'll see doesn't have that big an effect on how livable the Earth is, at least not the amount that we could change it. But how cost-effective energy is totally determines how livable the Earth is. Because without cost-effective energy, we have to use manual labor. We can't use machines. And then we find that the world is a very impoverished and dangerous place. That's why throughout history, life expectancy was 30, income was less than $500, and the population stagnated below a billion because everyone was just dying all the time. Only once we harness cost-effective energy on a large scale could we use machines to be productive and prosperous, 
and we could make the earth an abundant and safe place, including a place where we're safer than ever from climate. So it's really important what you guys are doing in terms of cost-effective and scalable energy. Sometimes people think, oh, it's good for the economy, but it's not good for the planet. No, no, no. It makes the planet livable. It's good from a pro-human perspective. It's amazing for, quote, the planet, because it's amazing for the human beings who live on this planet. The planet is not very good for humans without what you guys do. This is, this is, this is cutting out. I think this is a solar-powered uh, clicker. That's not only a good joke, it's actually, maybe it's wind? What's happening? Oh, here we go. All right, it came back. Wind, wind started blowing again. Um, and then kind of another thing you'll hear is, okay, well, yes, it's true. See, the, people see this chart. I love this chart. It shows, hey, look, as we are increasing fossil fuel use represented by CO2 emissions, people think the Earth is becoming a worse place to live, but in fact, life expectancy has gone up, income has gone up, population has gone up like a hockey stick. As soon as we started using fossil fuels, everything got better. People just say that's just a coincidence, right? It's actually medical care, sanitation, scientific progress, technological progress. Well, all of those are crucial, but all of those have totally depended on cost-effective and scalable energy from fossil fuels, as well as actually materials from fossil fuels. Like, take medical care. We can't have millions and millions of people working in medical care when everyone is working in the field. So one thing fossil fuels do is by allowing us to use machines, they free up huge amounts of time so that we can specialize. And then what about scientific progress and technological progress? Well, not only do we use machines for all those things powered by fossil fuels, but we only have the time to make scientific progress and technological progress when we have, when all of our time is freed up thanks to all these machines that provide for our basic needs. And sanitation, I mean, come on, same deal. We need workers for sanitation, we need machines for sanitation, and we certainly need petroleum products or natural gas products for sanitation. So it's so important, fossil fuels are just total, the, so the energy that fossil fuels provide, as well as the materials, is absolutely crucial for this to be a livable world for billions of people. So think about that. The number one most demonized industry in the world is actually is totally essential for the world to be a good place to live for eight billion people. And then we come to truth three, which is really tragic given this context, which is that most of the world's eight billion people lack the energy they need to flourish. So, people have some idea that, oh, well, we, can, we don't need that much energy. We can get by with less energy. We'll just do Zoom calls instead of flying in private jets, and we'll just be a little more efficient, and that'll be great. Like, there is no possibility of energy efficiency uh, diminishing the need for energy in the near future because most of the world uses way too little energy. So just to give you a sense, if you look at this chart, a third of the world is using wood and animal dung as their primary fuel for heating and cooking. We have three billion people who use less electricity than a typical US refrigerator does. I mean, one story I tell in, um, actually in both my books, but in my, particularly in my most recent book, Fossil Future, is you know, what this means for something like having a child. And so, it's June 16th now, so my wife and I had our first uh, child, and you, you're in the hospital, and it's just this amazing, like, you know, we had sort of minor complications, but even minor complications in a poor part of the world, like the mother can die, and the baby could die. And then you have something like, fortunately, this didn't happen to us, but it's very common, is the baby's born prematurely. And in the United States, you just have this incredible survival rate because we have things like incubators. But if you go to a place like the Gambia and a hospital there, they don't have incubators. Why? Because they don't have reliable electricity to power them. And you just, it's just a daily tragedy that, that is rarely talked about where just, so just the same child that in the United States would be totally healthy uh, just, just dies. Or you have, you know, you, they, even they don't have ultrasound machines or things that can screen for defects that they can then help with in the birth and just children are just dying. And this is just the daily reality. So you say the world doesn't, the world has plenty of energy, we don't need more energy and people can't even just incubate premature babies, let alone and even provide enough food. Uh, it's just, we're so, so, so short of energy and we need fossil fuels to do that. Overwhelmingly, we need fossil fuels to do that. So, 
Think about this. Fossil fuels are uniquely cost-effective and scalable energy that make the world a good place to live, and billions of people lack that benefit. So when, when we're thinking about the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels, before you even talk about climate or climate change, you need to recognize that without fossil fuels, the world will be a terrible place to live for basically everybody. So if, if we get rid of fossil fuels in the near future, that'll ruin basically everybody's life. Like all the estimates you hear of this will cost $5 trillion, like none of that is remotely uh, accurate. It, it would just like, there's nothing to compare like actually getting rid of fossil fuels. Given how crucial they are, nothing is close to them in terms of cost effectiveness and scalability, and there's a need for more of them. So now let's talk about climate, though. And the mistake that people make with climate is the mistake, same mistake they make with fossil fuels as a whole, which is they don't think of it as in an even-handed way. So when people talk about fossil fuels and climate, they only talk about negatives, and then they wildly exaggerate negatives. So when we're talking about fossil fuels and climate, we have to talk about negatives, but we also have to talk about positives. And let me just ask, can anyone think of any climate positives of burning fossil fuels? Particularly anyone who hasn't read my stuff. S sorry, oh, greater greening of the Earth? Yeah, so that's one of them, and that's particularly a benefit of their side effects. So side effects aren't always bad. Side effects can be good, bad, or neutral. So yes, when we burn fossil fuels, it puts more CO2 in the atmosphere, and that leads to more plant growth, including more crop growth. So in general, the Earth has become a much greener uh, place, which is one of several reasons I call the green movement the brown movement, because they actually their policies actually make the world a less lush place. Um, okay, that's one. Can anyone think of any other climate benefits of fossil fuels? Climate-related benefits of fossil fuels. Somebody said heating and cooling? Yes. So I think that's getting at the most important thing. And I call this, um, you know, I call this the climate mastery benefit. So when you think about fossil fuels and climate, you need to think of the benefits of the energy to climate and then you also need to think about the side effects, both pro and con. But the key thing with fossil fuels and climate that almost nobody talks about is they make the climate much, much more livable by allowing us to master climate dangers. So if you talk about heating and air conditioning, that allows us to live comfortably and safely in an incredible variety of climates. So it's making climate more livable. That's a climate benefit of fossil fuels, because if you don't have fossil fuels, you don't have affordable and scalable energy, and then most people can't have comfortable temperatures. Almost wherever they live, even in California where I live, Southern California, which is one of the nicest climates, even we need uh, heating and air conditioning sometimes, let alone in North Dakota or Calgary or uh, much of the world. So, but it's not just heating and cooling. The biggest climate-related benefit of fossil fuels historically has actually been drought relief. So drought was historically the biggest climate-related killer because when you have drought, you often have famine. And drought is just incredibly commonplace. But thanks to the use of fossil, to the use of fossil fuels for things like irrigation, so you take a place with drought and you still are able to grow crops, uh, and often powered by electricity, often powered by fossil fuels. So irrigation and then crop transport, moving crops from a place with a good harvest to a place that has a problem with drought, like those things have helped drive down the death rate from drought by 99%. So think about that. People are less than one in, they have one in 100th the likelihood of dying from drought that they used to. And this is overwhelmingly thanks to fossil fuels. So there are these huge climate-related benefits, and it's also building sturdy infrastructure we use fossil fuels for, storm warning systems we use fossil fuels for. So we need to think about the climate mastery benefits, and then we also need to think about, with the side effects, we need to think about, hey, what are the negative ones? So for example, let's say more heat waves, but also the positive ones. What about fewer deaths from uh, cold, or what about somebody mentioned greening? So this is what it means to think about it in an even-handed way. And when you look at it in an even-handed way, what you find is this truth for, that fossil fuels have given us climate mastery abilities that far outweigh the challenges. And this is one of my favorite charts, because we have this myth that we're endangered more than ever from climate thanks to fossil fuel CO2 emissions, but in reality, so this is a tally of, or this is this is the rate of deaths from climate-related disasters like storms and floods, extreme temperatures, and it's declined 98% since 1990. 
over the last 100 years. So this is the kind of fact, once you are able to think about this issue in an even-handed and pro-human way, this is one of the facts that's very powerful. So what I'm trying to stress is, if you can frame the issue in this very common sense way that's very powerful, and then you know the key truths and the fact, this is a powerful one. And one thing I've noticed is, politicians have been using this fact a lot recently, and it's been very hard for the mainstream media to deal with. So for example, Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis have both used this exact fact. And what happened is some of the media outlets started seeing this and they said, hey, how do we respond to this? And they asked the climate community, hey, how do we respond to this? And the climate community basically said, we can't refute this data. But then they, cl they claimed that it somehow didn't matter. So Reuters, you can look this up. They literally had an article that said, decline in climate disaster deaths, not evidence against climate emergency. So think about that, decline in climate disaster, that's not evidence against climate emergency. So the idea is, we acknowledge that there's been a massive decline in climate disaster deaths, but we still think there's an emergency. But my view is, if you don't recognize that fossil fuels have so far made the climate a lot safer and you don't lead with that, then I don't trust you about the future. Anyone who can't acknowledge the present cannot be uh, trusted to predict the future, but almost nobody says, hey, fossil fuels have made climate better than ever, and I'm worried about the future. If you said that, I'll listen to you. But if you say fossil fuels have ruined the climate and everyone's dying from climate, that is ignorant or a lie. So it's very important that fossil fuels so far have made the climate safer because the climate mastery benefits have far outweighed any challenges. Um, the other kind of argument you might hear is, well, it's costing us a lot more money. Everyone's becoming bankrupt thanks to fossil fuels. And the truth is, if you actually adjust for inflation and GDP growth, we don't, we don't have more climate damages, even though the government does a lot to incentivize people to build things in disaster-prone areas like flood areas and wildfire areas. So the truth is we're getting safer from climate largely thanks to fossil fuels. Now the final truth is addresses the future. Because you can say, okay, so far fossil fuels have made the world amazing and we need fossil fuels for energy in the future, but aren't they going to cause climate disasters in the future? So this came up a bit, if anyone heard that uh, Twitter slash X thing with, with uh, former President Trump and Elon Musk, like Elon has actually gotten a lot better on this. He used to be a climate catastrophist, now he's pretty modest, but he's like, yeah, but I'm still kind of worried about the future. His thing was it's going to be hard to breathe uh, if we have more CO2. You can ask me about that in the Q&A, he's definitely wrong about that, uh, but the, the, um, the, so it's important to look at what does climate science say? And the truth is, if you look at mainstream climate science, not what the media says, but if you actually look at the, the documents themselves, there are some biases, but even there, you're gonna see there's nothing that is actually gonna be a huge problem. So you'll sometimes hear, well, warming is, is gonna be a huge problem because heat-related death is already killing everyone, but actually, uh, this is from my friend Bjorn Lomborg, who I think has spoken here before. Um, if you look at heat-related deaths and cold-related deaths, cold-related deaths are far more frequent, which means that for the foreseeable future, warming will save more lives uh, than it takes. And then sometimes people think, oh, wait a second, but won't the warming occur most in the hot places? And then that's going to be, so it's going to be really bad. Uh, but actually, the truth is, mainstream climate science says that warming takes place most in colder regions, so places like the Arctic, and then colder seasons, winter, and then colder times of day, night. So it's actually warming in a benign way that's better for life than if it were concentrated in the warmer places already. And then sometimes you'll hear, well, warming is, okay, it might be fine for now, but it's gonna accelerate. As CO2 levels rise, it's gonna accelerate and the Earth is gonna burn up. Now, if you know anything about the history of the planet, this makes no sense, because we've had 10 times more CO2, the Earth definitely didn't burn up. So the truth is that in mainstream climate science, uh, the, what's called the greenhouse effect, which is the warming effect, it's not an accelerating effect where every new molecule has more power than the last. It's actually a decelerating effect or diminishing effect where each new molecule of CO2 has diminishing returns. So as you add more CO2, you get less warming over time. So in all the different things, it levels off over time. You're not going to have the planet burn up. It becomes more tropical, but it does not burn up. And then finally, you'll hear about, well, we have, we're going to have catastrophic sea level rises or storms. So sea level rises, that's the most plausible, because if you warm the Earth, um, you're at least going to have the oceans expand some, 
just because heat expands things. But the question is how much? And if you look even at extreme UN projections, you're talking three feet over 100 years. So far, we're at a pace of about, at the moment, we're about one foot per 100 years. So this is not something that human beings have a huge problem dealing with. We already have 100 million people living below high tide sea level. And then you'll also hear about, oh, hurricane intensity is going to get terrible, right? But if you look at the mainstream stuff, they're predicting you know, 1 to 10% more intensity and then less frequency. So this is not, it, so it's not, the idea is not we won't have any impact on climate. I think we will. Some of it will be challenges. Some of it will be positive. But the point is our ability to deal with climate will continue, is so much more important than the changes we're making in the climate itself. And that will only increase going forward. So, you know, if you look at the, what I've said from the beginning is we've, we've got this opportunity, this challenge and this opportunity. The challenge is the most popular idea in the world today, political idea, is that we should get rid of fossil fuels, even though we all here agree fossil fuels are crucial for electricity, and I hope I've shown you they're crucial for just about everything else good in the world. And I mentioned there's an opportunity right now because people are more open than ever to the truth because they're seeing the anti-fossil fuel agenda fail and because we have these new methods and arguments, so this even-handed and human-centered way of thinking about the issue and then these, these facts. And, and the facts, one thing I've tried to do here today and in general is make them really easy to remember and share. So again, I encourage you, please scan that QR code so you can get access to all of these facts. We literally have thousands of them, what we call energy talking points. And the goal there is to give you all the facts you need to know the truth in every situation and to tell the truth. And so with that, if you, if you have that framework, that even-handed and human-centered way of thinking about it, and if you have those basic truths and all the facts that support them, you can be incredibly powerful. And what it, what it leads to is what I call energy freedom. So energy freedom is, I heard you guys use all of the above. I don't really like that term because all of the above implies kind of everything is okay. Like we don't want to use animal dung, right? We don't, like all the above, that would imply animal dung and wood and stuff. So I like the term best of the above. But it's really about freedom. Like, hey, let's use the best energy for every situation. So we're not, we don't discriminate against anything. I guess if someone figured out how to use animal dung in a cost-effective and clean way, that would be fine. But we really want best of the above, and that's what energy freedom is about. So energy freedom is not a bias toward fossil fuels, nor is it a bias against fossil fuels. But what happens is if you have energy freedom, then what we have is we'll have billions of more people will be able to have the energy that they need to have a good life going forward, will be more prosperous, will be more innovative, will be better than ever at mastering climate. And the other thing is, that's also the best way to develop alternatives. If you actually want alternatives to develop, you need to be a wealthy, prosperous, and free society. You cannot be a society with, if you have a society with blackouts all the time and poverty, you are not going to innovate real alternatives. And the only way to actually lower CO2 emissions long-term, if that's your goal, is cost-effective and scalable alternatives. China is building 300-plus new coal plants because that's the cheapest thing to do. Most countries are going to do generally what's affordable for them. So if the U.S. just sacrifices ourselves in the name of emissions, we're not even going to lower emissions much, and we're going to ruin our own life, and we'll ruin a lot of the world. It doesn't make any sense. The, all the action with alternatives is how do you have cost-effective and scalable alternatives? That requires freedom. And so join me definitely in fighting for more freedom for nuclear, more freedom for geothermal, but also more freedom for fossil fuels. Because if we have that, we can have a much better world and versus net zero by 2050. That is a total catastrophe because it totally fails to recognize the unique benefits of fossil fuels. It's already been a disaster. And it would act, if they actually did it, which they won't fully, but many will try, it'd be the worst thing that ever happened to humanity. I mean that literally, and I know a lot of the things, I know all the bad things that have happened to humanity. There's nothing that compares to depriving 8 billion people of, of energy. This planet cannot support 8 billion people without a ton of energy, and we need fossil fuels to get it. So that's, that's my basic thing that I, I try to share with everyone, just as a final note for the electricity industry. My goal today has been to give you the framework and the facts that can help you tell the truth uh, because the world really needs you to tell the truth 
right now. I think because of, in general, the energy industry has not told the truth enough. I was talking with a good friend of mine last night. We happened to run into each other in Denver Airport. Chris Wright, maybe some of you have heard of him. He runs uh, Liberty Energy. And he's one of the few energy CEOs in fossil fuels who's been telling the truth for years. Chris and I have been at, you know, friends for years. We've been at events for years, and we've been at events where we're the only ones who are really saying what we think. It's not even that we're the only ones who agree with us, but other people just were afraid. And you know, for me, it's not that hard for me. Uh, like it's, it's, it's easier for me, it takes not that much courage for me to tell the truth. I mean, people like it when I tell the truth. So I can sell books by telling the truth, it's, get speeches by telling the truth. Chris, you know, he's an oil and gas CEO of a public company and yet he tells the truth. And what we talked about is just, it's not worth living life and it's just not fair if you don't tell the world the truth. And so we're seeing other people in oil and gas doing it, but in electricity, it's been even harder. I think because of the utility system and the government is so involved, it's so hard. And a lot of the stuff is kind of secretive, but the world needs to know what's happening to our grid. They need to know that in the name of net zero, we're artificially restricting the supply of reliable electricity and we're artificially increasing the demand and we're headed for a total catastrophe. Whereas if we had rational energy policy, we could have world leading electricity. But right now we're just absolutely headed for a catastrophe. So we need you guys to speak up, to tell the world these policies are bad, they're immoral, and, and, and tell us more specifically, you know, when I read these, these uh, reports from MISO or, or NERC or FERC, like it's very kind of couch language and people don't really know what it means. It's like somebody needs to tell the truth and I think you guys can help. And I will just say that if you, um, if you, if for whatever reason you can't tell the truth yourself, help me tell the truth. So th this is my email, direct email, alex at alexsubstein.com. If you have facts or anecdotes about the grid that you think would be helpful for me to know and share with the world, please share them directly and we can share them through energy talking points. But we're really at this crucial moment where the world needs electricity more than ever and the world needs the world of electricity to tell the truth more than ever. So. I've tried to help you do that. Uh, please scan the QR code. These resources will help you do that. Um, but, but please, please do it for, for your sake, for your kids' sake, uh, for everyone's sake. We really need a reliable grid. We don't have much more time and we need you guys to speak up. Thank you very much. In an effort to help everybody hear questions, we have three uh, microphones on mic stands uh, located in the audience that you can use to ask your questions. We also have two people, two mic runners. So if you are unable to get to those microphones, please raise your hand and someone will come to you. Oh, wait, who has, who's control? I'm not picking the people, right? Or is, are people just coming up here? Yeah, go for it. Howdy, Mr. Epstein. Hey, I like your book. Well, hey. But the, uh, the new one is better, so. You know, I, I lent, lent it out to a friend, so I'm okay. hopefully reading that pretty soon. Uh, if there's one statement that I could use uh, to change hearts and minds, what would that be? And then a sub-question, would you sign this book for me, sir? Yes, I'll definitely sign the book for you. But those of you are wondering, um, I have two books, Moral Case for Fossil Fuels and Fossil Future. J just, I'm happy to sign any of them for you, but, but definitely just get the new one. You don't need to get the old one. Um, so just get fossil future. The, um, it depends on the audience, right? It depends on what their interest is. But if it's an overarching idea, like the overarching idea with fossil fuels in particular is just the idea that fossil fuels are making the world a better and better place to live. Like, because that's, people have the idea that fossil fuels are making the world a worse and worse place to live. And it's important they're making the world a better and better place to live. And one thing I want to highlight about that is the tense of it. So what I do not like is when people say, hey, fossil fuels have helped us a lot. Like, it's not about the past. That's why my book is called Fossil Future. Like, the past is great, but it's not like fossil fuels were great. Now they're retiring. We're going to give them gold, a gold watch and social security and thank them for their service. It's like, fossil fuels are used more than ever today. So when you say they're making the world a better and better place, that captures that they have done that, but also that it's actively happening now. 
and then that allows you to talk about all the subcomponents in terms of, well, they're the ones who are uniquely providing cost-effective and scalable energy, and that makes the world a good place, including it makes us safer than ever from climate, and whatever challenges there have been in climate have been overwhelmed, and the evidence we have is that challenges we face going forward, we can deal with, and so fossil fuels are making the world a better and better place to live. So that's the number one uh, thing I would say. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. Hello? Hey. Yeah, so, Craig Gates, Hill County Electric, oh, sorry. Montana. Can you hear me? Oh, there, okay. So you made a comment about um, Elon's mega packs and $100 trillion. How yes. did you come up with that math? What's that? How did you come up with that math? Oh, yeah, so the math, um, and by the way, all of the, again, remind people, scan your QR codes, and you can also check out energytalkingpoints.com. Yeah, so the math is very simple. You basically just look at, um, so I did it per day of storage. So you basically look at what's global energy use per day, and then what would it, how much, like how many kilowatt hours or you know, terawatt hours or more than that, do you st is it to store that for a day? And then you go to Elon's website and say, what are your best, I want to order that much battery, and that's what you get. That's, that's how you do it. I mean, in practice, they don't allow you to make that big an order, so you have to take the fraction of the order and then multiply it. But that's, that's how you do it. Yes. Yeah, I got a question in regards to, when you talk about climate change, I just need, want your thoughts on this. My feeling is, with climate change, it has nothing to do about the climate, the people at the top that are pushing this agenda. I think they want control. What's your opinion on that? It has nothing to do about climate. They want to control your thoughts, your actions, and what you do every day. Thanks. Well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I don't think it's true of everyone. It's definitely not true of everyone who's concerned about the issue. I think it's true of a lot of the leadership and the thing to recognize about it is that the idea that human climate impact is a catastrophe is very appealing to people who want control because everything we do emits CO2. And so if our CO2 is destructive, then they have a license to control everything we do. It's kind of like with COVID when there was this idea everyone could be a killer. Well, if everyone could be a killer by breathing, then you get to control everybody's body. And some people really liked that. So some people were kind of, they, were, they had an excessive reaction. They, they, weren't, they didn't want the control. They felt like they needed it. But for people who want control over others, the idea that CO2 emissions are catastrophic is the most uh, appealing idea they've ever found because it justifies universal control in their mind. So they, they like it. They, want in, they like things where freedom is destructive because they want to take away freedom. If, if it were true that freedom, hey, we can live good lives in freedom, then there's no need for their control. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned the term uh, climate denier earlier. Yeah, climate which, change denier, yeah. Which, which brings into the thing about the uh, lie about the uh, uh, consensus of 97% of climate yeah. scientists agree. Well, first of all, consensus, it, I realize, is a political word, not a scientific word. But also, every great scientific discovery in the history of the world, the day before, from Galileo to Copernicus to Louis Pasteur to Edison, the day before that was proved right, they were deniers. They were against the, uh, the consensus was against them. So people need to pay attention to the deniers. That's the important thing. Uh, I think there's, I agree with part of that. So here's the thing. So it's, it's absolutely true that often people with non-mainstream views are right. And it is a very dangerous to have the idea that you will not listen to non-mainstream views, and therefore it is very dangerous and wrong to do anything to demonize views because they're outside the mainstream. So in any kind of, of area where there's room for debate and exploration, the use of the term denier is, you have to be very careful um, about it. I have one way in which I think it's appropriate to use, but not, not about climate. So I definitely agree with that. But at the same time, often the non main and, and so I have a non-mainstream view about fossil fuels, and I think it's totally right, and I think people should listen to it. But it's also true that non-mainstream views can be crazy. 
right? People can be cranks and that kind of thing. So if you think about the position of individuals or governments when it comes to scientific knowledge, I think there is a role for looking at consensus in this, there's a lot to say about this, but basically like look at, hey, it's good to know, not that you have to act on it, but hey, what is the current state of agreement and disagreement in the field? And, but this is crucial, and why, right? You wanna know, hey, what do people think and what are their reasons? It's certainly not enough to say, well, 97% of the people say X and I don't even know why. And when you do that, actually what happens is you don't even know what you're talking about because when people say 97% of climate scientists agree, you can check this out at energytalkingpoints.com, they don't even know what they agree about because what they agree about is that we have some impact on climate, not that there's a climate catastrophe or we should get rid of fossil fuels. So when people cite 97%, they don't even know what they're talking about. So the key is you want an accurate summary of the current views in the field and why people hold them. That is, in, that, if you mean, if somebody means that by consensus, that's fine. But it should never be that we demonize people with different views, and it should never be that we dogmatically agree with things without any explanation. And then the final thing is, we, should, we can never just consult one field when we're dealing with interdisciplinary issues. This is in part what happened with COVID, is people just consulted doctors who are focused on um, this infectious disease. And yeah, if you ask a doctor, hey, if their whole focus is this infectious disease, and you say, what do you do? They're, they might be inclined to just focus on how do you limit this infectious disease. But that's not the right decision for the country as a whole. You need to consult everyone. You need to consult economists. You need to consult other kinds of doctors where you won't be able to do procedures if you just focus on COVID. You need to consult teachers. So in energy, it's the same thing. We not only shouldn't dogmatically listen to a supposed uh, consensus of climate scientists, we can't just listen to climate scientists. We need to look at the full spectrum of, of information relevant to the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels. And that's why Barbara Boxer was so wrong when she said at the beginning, she said, Mr. Epstein, are you a scientist? It's Epstein, by the way. I'm not related to Jeffrey Epstein, also, in case anyone's wondering. She said, Mr. Epstein, are you a scientist? I said, no, I'm a philosopher. And she basically said, you don't need a philosopher. We just need climate scientists. I said, no, you need philosophers to help you think about the issue. And then you need climate scientists, economists, energy experts, electricity experts. And if you don't do that, you're going to make terrible decisions, even if the climate scientists were being accurately represented, which they are not. Uh, we have a hand there. Do you have a microphone? Yes, uh, Stephen Wagner at Slope Electric. Two things. Uh, Price signal and morality. Okay. With price signal in the utility business, you make the investment and the price signal is sent much later. And so your customers aren't getting the, the price signal that they should be getting today yes. about the cost. The other thing is morality. One thing you can do to offend somebody is to question their morality. And it seems to me that many people are associating net zero or saving the planet or whatever with their own morality. Difficult to combat. And what do you think uh, distribution cooperatives director's role is in speaking to his neighbors about that? Speaking to his neighbors about it. I mean, yeah, they're, they're the price thing is a really interesting thing. And that's, th there's questions about what policies can be improved to do that, which I'd like to think through some more. Um, but I think in terms of the you know, it being a moral issue. I mean, what they're basically saying is the use of fossil fuels is a moral issue because it has these long-term negative consequences and, and that implicitly they're saying that far outweigh any positives and that it's sort of we have a long-term responsibility to get rid of it. And I think what you should say is it's the opposite if you actually look carefully at the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels going forward, we have a long-term responsibility to embrace the world's use of fossil fuels and to expand it and really to support the freedom for it, both here and around the world. So kind of the most stark cases are, I mentioned the Gambia and other places. I mean, you have, uh, I've made a couple of visits to uh, Africa to talk about energy. And you just have people so excited about pipelines and hydrocarbon development and more electrification. And the US is basically giving them the middle finger and saying, don't do that. Just use a bunch of solar panels. It'll work somehow. We're not willing to do that, but you guys should do that. 
and, and yeah, it'll work. It'll work just fine. So it, it, it's sort of, it's powerful that it's a moral issue, but I do think it is a moral issue. So I would say that the goal, that you need to talk about it that way, uh, but that it's the reverse of what people think. It's not fossil fuels are making the world a worse and worse place to live. They're making the world a better and better place to live, and that's, you should be proud to be associated with them, and it's shameful to be associated with their elimination because that means harming us and harming the world. In regards to uh, solar and wind turbines and everything, we hear that they, and obviously they have zero carbon output with what they produce, but do we have an estimate or off the top of your head what carbon footprint it takes to manufacture them for wind turbine and solar and how long they have to run efficiently to offset that? Yeah, so there's a spectrum of views on this issue, but the everything I've seen supports the idea that if reliability didn't matter, which of course it matters more than anything, then solar and wind would be a good energy investment and on their own, sort of the panel, certainly the solar panels, like they produce more, way more energy over their lifetime than it takes to create them. So sometimes people say they'll never produce as much energy as they use. That's not true. Now, they'll never produce as much reliable energy as they use. So I think that the key thing, the number one thing with solar and wind is this intermittency slash reliability issue. That's really the thing. And we always need to not conflate reliable electricity and unreliable electricity. And as I indicated before, I think the key is what we want to do is not demonize solar and wind, but recognize the deficiency of allowing unreliable electricity on the grid and basically say that, hey, it's the response, it should be the responsibility of generators. To, it, now, it depends on what kind of thing you're doing. So co-ops can be different. Like, if it's, if you are totally, have your own self-contained grid, and you, you know, you can run simulations, and you might say, hey, you know what? 4% solar will be good, uh, because, like, at that level, it'll save us some money on fuel, and it won't cause us too many problems, et cetera. Like, that, that can be legitimate. I've seen simulations to that effect. Um, but if you're talking about 40%, that's totally uneconomic. That's a total fraud. But, but like, it's either you're a grid that's sort of making, that's responsible for everything, and you can make those decisions. But if you're talking about markets and the RTOs and stuff like that, I think ultimately there, you just have to have some kind of requirement that table stakes are reliable electricity or dispatchable electricity. And then it's the responsibility of the generating entity to make solar and wind reliable. So Elon, like my view is, hey, Elon, I posted this on X the other day. Um, like, I'm totally in favor of you exploring solar and mega packs, but you, why don't you provide reliable electricity to the grid using that? I don't care how you do it, but you do it. And I think if you required everyone to do dispatchable electricity, then you'd find out the real cost of this stuff. So, so my question's maybe a little bit off topic from the, but it goes to the well-being and I don't uh -huh. know if you have any comments around, are we trading uh, today's environmental concerns for more significant environmental concerns right. of the future? And does the energy transition or what things look like in the future actually pose a greater risk to us for our well-being in society than where we are today? And, and, and are, you, are you primarily thinking about the energy dimension or are you thinking about any other dimension? Because sometimes people focus on like, yeah. what's it going to be like to pave the whole world with solar panels? But are you mostly focusing on the energy so, dimension? So, you know, some of the things you think about is, is again, we, energy storage is really important. Right? Yeah. And fossil fuel is definitely gets us better dispatchability than intermittency. Yeah. To get intermittency taken care of right now, one of the big pushes is batteries, correct? Right. And so batteries, um, you know, are we, we trading a lesser evil for a more evil given potentially the amount of uh, hazards I that see. go okay. along with batteries? And then you think about some of yeah. the other things that go along of disposal, um, right. other elements that we don't talk a lot about maybe. Right, okay, got it. I just wanna make sure I understood. So, so yeah, there, it's, it's very valid to bring up kind of the, what you could call like life cycle environmental concerns with solar, wind, batteries, in the sense of 
whenever you're doing anything, you need to look at the full process and you want to make sure you're, you're advocating a process that's going to be responsible now and in the future. So, but that said, I don't think there's anything inherently problematic about having a ton of, if you could do this solar wind battery thing, I don't think there's anything inherently problematic about it. Now, you might not like the land use of it, but you, there are ways to kind of, um, you know, if the, the main problem is the cost. So if, if, just imagine you could do solar wind batteries and electricity would be one-fifth the cost, um, and you could scale it in a way that was responsible, you actually made sure, you know, you did the mining well and you did the, did the disposal well, you didn't just trash everything in a rush. Like, that would be amazing if you could actually, now, you would have some, maybe it's more transmission lines than you would like and maybe it's more land use than you'd like, but I would for sure take one-fifth cost electricity. I mean, that would be so amazing, it would be worth it. The primary problem is the financial cost is just absolutely prohibitive and there's just no near-term way to scale this anytime soon. And so it's, it's bad to try it, it's bad to force it on people and it's certainly bad to forcibly deprive them of fossil fuels. Um, because of the pace at which they are advocating it, this crash course, there will be a lot of unnecessary, unnecessary damage, just people disposing of things in irresponsible ways. But I think, I don't want to demonize them inherently because I do think you can do batteries in responsible ways. You can do solar panels in responsible ways. You can do wind turbines. You can do transmission lines. You can do those in responsible ways. Uh, but the main thing is, are they actually cost effective? So to, to force them on us when they're not cost effective, that's the main evil because it makes us poor. And poor people have bad environments. Other questions? Alex, um, nice job. I gotta Thank tell you. you that. That was very, very good. Thank you. Things, things that we believe in anyway. But you made a comment in the middle of this thing that said, be the voice and everybody has the power to stand up and drive home these same topics. It doesn't hurt ever to at least ask the questions to provoke thought. And that's what you've done today. I would encourage everybody in here to follow his instruction and be the voice. Stand up, start asking questions. So, nice job, very nice. Oh, thank you. And I'd say one thing about that is, oh, thank you. All right. So, one thing about that is sometimes people find it intimidating because they think I'm going to have to be a full-time activist or something like that. Um, you know, the, the baseline thing you can do that's incredibly effective and incredibly underrated, and I don't know how to really... I always try to convince people of this, and I'm, I'm never fully successful, but at least I'm partially successful, is, like, you really want to be a credible sharer of good material. Like, that's really the thing that most change is made of, where someone you, think about how you've been influenced, right? Someone you trust says, hey, like I read this book, I read this article, it made me think differently about the issue. So there's two elements of there. There's, there's the credibility and then there's the sharing. And so with this issue, part of the credibility is, well, obviously you have relationships, but also that you talk about it in a reasonable way, in a relatable way. So you're like, look, like I don't have a bias against fossil fuels, like I'm not just, even if you work in the industry, like don't like probably you work in the industry because you think it's a good thing and because you recognize this is a uniquely this industry is uniquely good. It's not like you just randomly had a fetish for fossil fuels. So just come across as, hey, I'm just a reasonable person. I want, you know, I think energy is important. I think we need to look at the trade-offs of different forms of energy. And I think fossil fuels have a lot more positives than people think and fewer negatives than people think. And then feel free to drop my materials in my name. Hey, this guy, Alex Epstein, is really interesting. Check out this thing at energytalkingpoints.com. I mean, we just pushed out, um, if you just go to energytalkingpoints.com, or it's also on Substack, alexepstein.substack.com. But really just scan your thing, and then you'll get all of this. We put out something recently called Energy Sound Bites. And it's just all of these ideas in 100 characters or less that you can even remember and repeat. So just the stuff, we've created all this stuff, it's all free. It's, and, and also we have, it's, it's gonna be free soon. 
you should def another reason to sign up, we have Alex AI. So this is an AI that literally answers any question as me. And you can ask it, hey, my coworker said this, what do I say? And it gives pretty good answers. And it's, it's behind a paywall now, but it'll be free in the next month or two. So another reason to sign up. So all you have to do is be credible and share. You think about the American Revolution, good revolutions, bad revolutions. It's just by people with credibility sharing good material. So don't think you have to give speeches like I do, or you have to have a three-hour conversation with your, with your cousin uh, because like you have some societal obligation, like don't have that conversation if you don't want to. But maybe you could have a three minute conversation with them or talk to somebody more open-minded. So make it something that's enjoyable. And if you, have, if you come across as credible and you share good materials, it'll be an enjoyable experience for the most part and uh, it, it won't be suffering. Anything else? I mean, I can go forever, but it says zero up here. Oh, I think I'm being walked off. So, are we done? Oh, I think we have one more. Or do we have one more? Is it safe to say that fossil fuel um, growth would be the fastest way to, to stay even with the demand that we see coming in the future? Nothing against the, the green, mm -hmm. but if you want to attain this, is fossil fuel a way to do it and possibly the safest? Because I'm going to get questioned on this Well, as a board member now. So yes. I just want to know what so, I should. Well, I have, I have a very clear, people hate yes and no answers, but I'll explain exactly why it's yes and no. Yes, in terms of the sort of raw economics of the situation independent of policy, so if you want to, I mean, if you want to scale up electricity production in this country, I mean, I love coal plants, but you can build those, but certainly just build natural gas plants. And, um, and we have huge, we could expand our pipeline capacity. So, I mean, look, natural gas plants, you can build very quickly. Physically, we know how to build them quickly. Um, but you'd basically just build natural gas and coal plants. I think that would be, because what's the alternative? You're not going to build oil plants, although you could just because oil is more expensive per unit of energy. Um, and solar and wind, you don't get the reliability. Battery, is, uh, it's, battery storage is not even in the universe of making solar and wind reliable. It can provide a buffer, but that buffer can be just as good for just being like you need a little bit less natural gas peaking capacity. Energy storage is good regardless of solar and wind, but don't confuse energy storage with it's going to make solar and wind independent, which it, it won't anytime soon. So basically, yeah, the raw economics are very simple. The problem is we have a, and this is part of the reason to fight, we have a government that is trying to prohibit you from doing what is good for your customers. So you look at just, among many other things, the recent EPA power plant rules, they make these rules so convoluted and give them stupid names, but it's basically two core ideas. And again, we have a lot about this at energytalkingpoints.com. One is do not build any, new, uh, shut down your existing coal plants unless you can do this carbon capture at a rate that you absolutely cannot do it even non-economically. And then also do not build new natural gas plants to replace them. So you're shutting down the coal fleet and you can't build new natural gas. That's what they're trying to do. Now, m people try to get around that in various ways and we should fight against it. I'm really glad North Dakota's fighting against it. But what you should tell your customers is, the best thing for you is for us to rapidly build natural gas and coal, and our government is trying its best to stop us from doing that. That's the truth. And that would be great to tell the world that too. Somebody's gotta hit a gong for me or something because I just don't know when to, to leave. All right. <laughs> Thank you.